Erev Tov, I'm Stephen ben -Noon. You are watching Israeli News Live. We'll be talking about several stories this evening. Uh, we're definitely on the brink of world war is our main topic, a special report I'll be doing on this evening with you on this. Uh, the NSA was targeted for a, uh, by a terrorist attack according to CNN News today in the United States and Maryland. Uh, from what we understand, one, per, one gunman, uh, one of the terrorists there were killed, another was arrested, uh, and two people were actually injured in that attack. Uh, the Arabs in Israel have warned of an explosion on the Land Day anniversary. Of course, the Land Day anniversary came and went, and there was very little violence whatsoever. Of course, there was rioting in uh, different parts of the country, uh, but not as explosive as the Palestinians had promised it to be. Uh, also, the Czech president, uh, Zaman, is actually going to attend Victory Day celebrations in Moscow. We certainly applaud him for doing that. Uh, he's getting a lot of snubs from the Western world leaders for doing so. Uh, amid the, the, the uh, situation in Ukraine, but there again, the Ukrainian crisis would not be there had it not been for the West toppling, trying to topple a perfectly legitimate um, government to begin with. So our hats off to President Zaman of the Czech Republic uh, for putting aside all the snubs from the West and NATO and going to Moscow for Victory Day, as he put it. In a speech earlier that he did on television there, he said that we must remember that it was Russia that liberated many of the concentration camps of Europe as well, including Auschwitz. So therefore, we cannot forget what they have actually done for us. Very good point. Uh, and of course, we know the United States as well liberated many of them, many, many concentration camps as well, actually. No former soldiers that were part of that. Uh, and very, very, very uh, moving to begin with to know the different people that liberated the Jewish people um, from a total annihilation by Hitler and his regime. All right, then. In, in the news that we're doing this evening here, I'm going to be featuring several different uh, speakers there that uh, I've used some uh, just the other day uh, when we were speaking about uh, Russia and the Ukraine conflict, but also uh, a couple of others as well. George Friedman will be one of those speakers. He's an American political scientist. Uh, he regularly briefs military commanders uh, as, as well as uh, Defense University and the, and the, and the Rolling Corp. Uh, excuse me, the Rand Corporation, and he's the author of The Next Hundred Years. By the way, on his book, The Next Hundred Years, he said that Ukraine would fall into a war in 2015, a civil war uh, of sorts, and he was dead on on that. And he also uh, predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, due to uh, the demise of a financial situation, which he said he may have been off a little bit on that maybe earlier. Uh, also, American scholar Stephen Cohen, his interview with Sophia on the Sophia program on RT News. Um, he is a um, scholar, uh, an American scholar on Russian affairs, and a uh, very interesting interview there that he did. Dr. Paul Kingor, professor of political science from Grove City College, uh, his particular interview at the Franciscan University, a Catholic university, he's also the autobiographer of uh, Ronald Reagan, former President Ronald Reagan, former Director of Operations of the CIA as well, John Stockwell, in his book, uh, he's an author of the book called Secret Wars of the CIA, and um, these different men and these different analysts, especially uh, Friedman and, um, uh, and even uh, Mr. Cohen, Steve Cohen, have been looking at the Ukraine conflict here recently. They're Analysts that, although they do not uh, specifically come out and speak about the toppling of nations that the United States does and, and its NATO allies, uh, it still goes hand in hand with the information that uh, Paul Ken Gore speaks about when uh, the, what the what was termed as the Time Magazine, the Holy Alliance, that uh, collapsed the Soviet Union, and as well as the former director of CIA, John uh, Stockwell. Uh, very, very interesting information where John also clearly identifies the, uh, the place that the United States does in these, particular, uh, in these particular programs. So let's go right into this particular news and we will inject these commentaries as we go. Mischief. Every covert operation, of course, rationalized in terms of national security or anti-communism. We've got lots and lots and lots of these out in the public record. The world is only so big, these things are never completely secret. 
You can read for yourselves at great length about these things. We've set out to overthrow functioning constitutional democracies in over 20 countries. We manipulated elections in dozens of countries. We created standing armies and directed them to fight. We went after to organize ethnic minorities to encourage them to revolt. The first thing we did in Nicaragua was to go to the Mosquito Indians, who had never gotten along with the other people in Nicaragua very well, and give them more money than they had seen in the entirety of history, and arms and training and rationales and sanctuaries in Honduras, and sent them into Nicaragua to attack, kill, fight, rape, burn, pillage. And this is an insidious thing. Every society is torn with racial conflicts and conflicts with minorities. Think how violent our nation is. Think what if there were a super, super power so big that we didn't dare even flap back or strike back at them that were coming to our minorities with huge sums of money and arms and, and, and training people from our minority groups and sending them into the country to do open acts of violence how we would rise up and the bloodbath that would ensue. And this has been a technique the CIA has used in Nicaragua, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Laos, in the Congo, in, in Iran, Iraq with the Kurds in different parts of the world. We created, trained, and funded death squads like the Treasury Police in El, Swel El Salvador that are responsible for killing as many as 70,000 people according to the count of the Catholic Church. And we've assassinated world leaders, including the United States president in 1963. And I'll get to that in more detail in just a moment. Getting back Reuters published an article here recently on March the 27th. Uh, it's an article that's uh, very disturbing, in fact. It's called Ukrainian Nationalist Battalion Ready to Battle Pro-Russian Rebels. I say it's disturbing uh, because, in fact, with what I'm fixing to share with you here, it is very evident that we are on the brink of world war, and uh, especially starting right off here in Europe. This is something that uh, not many people want. Russia apparently does not want it, but Russia is very, uh, very much realizes that it is that it is definitely inevitable. They are being blamed. It's kind of interesting, as we brought out in the special report the other day. Uh, that the United States was very instrumental in toppling uh, the perfectly legitimate government in Ukraine uh, and, of course, blaming it on the pro-rebels in, in the Ukrainian government. Uh, that's why we actually started this segment off with you to be able to listen to the former CIA director, uh, John Stockwell, and it's very, very pertinent information in light of what's happening in Ukraine and the news that I'm sharing with you there. As he put it about the Nicar in Nicaragua, how that they took the, the Mosquito Indians and the U.S. government funded them to go in, give them more money, as he said, than they've ever seen in their entire lives, and then train them, prepare them to go into overthrow the Nicaraguan government, but not just overthrow it, to, as he put it, rape, burn, pillage, this is the exact same things that we are seeing in Ukraine. This is what the National Guard, the, the, you have to remember, Poroshenko, when he became the president uh, after the, the legitimate government was overthrown, excuse me, yeah, the le legitimate government was overthrown, Poroshenko became president, and the military, he was concerned, would not be faithful to him because there's many Eastern uh, Russian uh, Ukrainians that are part of the military. And they made it quite clear they were not going to go kill their own people. So he formed a new National Guard with the help of the West, the United States, and, and, and NATO allies uh, in doing this. And they have done exactly that. There are many, many uh, films that we actually have. I cannot even share with you because they're too graphic. And they have done exactly that. They have murdered children. Uh, they have bombed, shelled. Even, even you will find out that they have actually, uh, and this was according to uh, the, the professor of, uh, American professor Stephen Cohen on the RT uh, to, uh, show, Russia Today show with Sophia, actually admits that in one of the violations that Kiev did of the Minsk agreement, Kiev actually violated and to begin to shell in the, in the, in the Donetsk region and they hit schools there 
uh, on the day that uh, the children were going back to school. It is intentional. It is an intentional bloodbath, uh, to say the very least there. So at any rate, uh, let me bring this uh, article to you from Reuters. Uh, this is Reuters article, Ukraine Nationalist Battalion Ready to Battle Pro-Russian Rebels. Uh, it says, Ukraine, the far-right uh, Azov Battalion, whose symbol resembles a black swastika on a yellow background, is preparing to defend uh, the port city of Maripol in southeastern Ukraine. Uh, alongside the army and the use of symbols echoing Nazi emblems have caused alarm in the West and Russia. I don't think it's caused alarm in the West. They may say it audibly, but clearly, uh, of course, Vladimir Putin actually has brought this up already. I've heard it on the news there. And he says, why is Kiev allowing this particular emblems and not just the swastika? We've actually seen film footage of them carrying SS flags, Nazi SS flags into battle. Uh, but anyway, they say that uh, and let me say this, there are Western leaders that would be troubled by this, because remember, the, the Obama administration does not uh, speak for all the Americans by far. We have many American supporters uh, of Israel, for example. They back Israel, uh, and of course, the Obama administration does not back Israel at all. We will be going to this issue as well, Israel and the overthrow of uh the government there in Israel, the destabilization of Israel, because they're all linked together. But anyway, it says, uh, said here, and could return to haunt Kiev's pro-Western leadership when fighting eventually ends. Pro? <laughs> Let's read that again, that last part there. They use the symbols echoing Nazis, the Nazi emblems have caused alarm in the West and Russia, and could return to haunt Kiev's pro-Western leadership when fighting eventually ends. Exactly, because what? That would be like the United States sponsoring Hitler during his fight, during his war. But nonetheless, what does this show us? The United States, along with NATO, uh, the allies of NATO there, they are fighting the Crusades for the Vatican, for the Pope of Rome. This is why we see that the Pope of Rome in September is actually going this year, September 2015, I believe it's on the 22nd of September. He arrives in Washington, D.C. He will go to the White House first. Then the next day, he actually goes and speaks to both houses of, uh, of, of Congress, House of the Congress and to the Senate. He'll be speaking there. And then after that, he goes to New York to the United Nations and speaks at the United Nations General Assembly. He is exalting himself as the world's leader. Not to mention here recently in a news article, it is published that he is now doing miracles. He has turned a dry vial of dry blood into a liquid blood. That has been reported on the news now. Uh, so he is the miracle worker. He is going to assert his authority. He's going to proclaim peace. And by the way, the proclaiming peace is very interesting. I was actually trying to highlight an article about him and this very issue that we were going to use in the news. And every time I highlighted it, the last word in the article was the word peace. It would not highlight, period. It would not highlight. I tried several times, had to turn the computer off, turn it back on. Finally, I had to write it in myself. That it was so, spoke so loud to me because why? The scripture says they will say peace and safety. They will cry peace, peace, and there is no peace. And clearly there is no peace. That is just an outright fact. So nonetheless, he's going to exert it. He is the one that is that is pushing the buttons. Uh, the United States is definitely at his beck and call. And we see that all the world leaders go to the Vatican to begin with. The president of the United States, uh, the Ukrainian president, uh, the current prime minister of Ukraine, uh, even, even Russia's uh, president, Vladimir Putin, has been to, to the Vatican. Every world leader goes to the Vatican. And every place that the Pope's foot steps on is what he considers to be conquered. And of course he did, Pope Paul, uh, John Paul II, went to Kiev after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But then what happened? Uh, we find out that uh, the, the, the former president here uh, of Kiev uh, decided he didn't want to be part fully of the European Union. He wanted to also work with Russia. And of course the West wouldn't have that at all. Reagan said this. Of he, of he and John Paul II, this is Reagan's own words, 
We both felt that a great mistake had been made at Yalta and that something must be done. Yalta is where Poland and the other Eastern European countries basically fell behind the Iron Curtain, right? 1945. Solidarity in Poland was the very weapon for bringing this about. Reagan told the Pope in this June 1982 meeting, hope remains in Poland and we, working together, can keep it alive. Can keep it alive. Now maybe in the Q&A I could go through exactly what they did, how they worked together. Um, among other things, a lot of intelligence sharing went on that we still don't know about. It's amazing how many of these documents are still classified, especially on the Vatican side where they were classified for like 75 years. Uh, they, did, uh, they had their staffs meeting together constantly. There was one team, Bill Casey, the CIA director, who as I said was Catholic, Ambassador Vernon Walters, they would fly, Casey would fly in a, in a black, black jet without windows, a C-141, he would fly it to the Vatican. And we know that Casey and Walters met with John Paul II at least 15 times in the six years between 1981 and 87 when Casey was, was, secret, was, uh, was DCI, Director of Central Intelligence. Back in Washington, the key players were Bill Clark, Casey, and P.O. Loggi, the uh, apostolic delegate to the, to the United States. They would meet constantly. Um, Clark says, Casey and I dropped into Loggi's residence early mornings during critical times to gather his comments and counsel. I'd speak to him frequently on the phone. He would be in touch with the Pope. Uh, on at least six different occasions, Loggi came to the White House, met personally with me and Reagan. Uh, Casey and Clark had this code, code language because they were always fearful that the phones were bugged. If, if something hot was happening in Poland where they thought they might need to talk to the Pope or talk to Loggi, Clark would pick up the phone and he would say to Casey, I think we need to get some cappuccino. And that meant they needed to meet with Cardinal Loggi. They would go over to his residence and they would meet. So uh, they worked together. The Berlin Wall falls in 1989. The rest is history, collapse of communism. Um, Berlin Wall. Continuing on in the article here, he says, uh, we don't like the ceasefire at all. This is what the leader of the, um, of the National, uh, National Guard unit f for fighting for um, the, the Ukraine, Ukrainian president Poroshenko says uh, that he's the far right Azov battalion leader. He says, uh, we don't like the ceasefire at all. As with the previous ones, it's only led to another offensive, as he calls it, by the enemy. This is Azov commander uh, Andrei uh, Beltsky, is his name, said while watching uh, artillery drills at Yuzov, on the shores of the Sea of Azov, about 40 kilometers southwest of Maripol. Appeasing, he says, appeasing the aggressor will only lead to more aggression. And this is where he really uh, very serious comedy makes here. This war will inevitably continue either until our complete defeat or until our full victory and return to our land in all East Ukraine and Crimea. Believe me, Russia has heard that. And that's exactly what the United States is pushing for as well. Uh, the Pope of Rome is not going to be satisfied with just Ukraine. He wants Crimea as well. He is uh, about for world dominance. This is one reason why we see that he went to the Eastern uh, countries recently to show that he had conquered them as well. Uh, he goes on to say, um, we believe in the second uh, scenario, uh, said the 35-year-old from the city of uh, Kharkiv. Now, jumping down a little bit further in the article here, it says, Kiev and the West uh, say Russia drives the rebellion in East Ukraine, the United States and, and, of course, the uh, NATO allies, and has sent in troops as well as weapons to help the separatists. Moscow has says, sided with the rebels but denies direct military involvement. In fact, U.S. Uh, different analysts have claimed that this is not true, that it is only propaganda uh, by the United States to, to incite more war, that this is not happening. The article goes on to say under, under the, uh, the heading of Patriot of Ukraine, says the Azov Battalion originated from uh, Bel Bel Beletsky Parliamentary National Socialist Group called 
uh, the Patriots of Ukraine, which propagated slogans of white supremacy, racial purity, and the need for authoritarian power and centralized national economy. Now, this is exactly, if you remember what you were listening to earlier, this is exactly what the former Director of Operations, uh, CIA Director of Operations, uh, John Stockwell, mentions that they look for to, 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 to divide the nations, to topple them by using a racial divide. This is where your ethnic cleansing comes from. You'll also find that uh, the United States uh, actually fund, funded the Iranians and the Iraqis to fight one another, to keep them busy, preoccupied, so they don't fight the, the, the United States. And it, it works. It definitely does work. That's something we'll see uh, in, in a few moments there where uh, Mr. Friedman, uh, Dr. Friedman actually speaks about that very thing. It's also exactly what the United States did by creating ISIS. Uh, they created ISIS, they trained them in Jordan, and then what did they do? They sent them in to keep what? Lebanon busy, uh, that, you know, with, with uh, the leader of Hezbollah, to keep them busy, to keep the Syrians busy, to keep uh, to cause more chaos in Iraq again. Constantly the Shiites and the Sunnis killing one another. That way the United States doesn't have to get directly involved and always have to use uh, our own troops in order to fight the battles. So that's, that's why we can see what's exactly, exactly, exactly is happening here. And, uh, but anyway, pa the uh, Patriot of Ukraine opposed giving up Ukraine's sovereignty by joining in, uh, international blocs and called for rolling back of lib the liberal economy and political democracy, including free media. In 2008, uh, Beletsky urged thousands of young fanatic apostles to advance its ideas. Local media have reported on several violent incidents in which this group was involved. So we can see that there was already that incitement had began quite some time back and from what we understand with uh with uh john stockwell that's exactly the way the west does in toppling legitimate democracies when he did it back in when he made his interview back in 1989 he said that the united states had toppled 20 at that time well they've been a lot more since then and ukraine has now been added to the list uh, but anyway, since Azov uh, was officially created last May, it has been involved in uh, fighting of the outskirts of the rebe rebe uh, rebel stronghold of uh, Don Don Donetsk, a battle for the town of Ilavask, which Ukraine forces lost uh, last summer and uh, across the coast of the Sea of Azov. Uh, but since Azov was enrolled uh, as a regiment of the Ukraine National Guard in September and started receiving increased supplies of heavy arms, uh, Beletsky has toned down his rhetoric somewhat there. That's so they don't get any backlash in Washington. Beletsky said uh, he now has infantry and artillery units and was building a proper tank force. The United States has already admitted publicly now they're sending arms to Ukraine. And as uh, I believe it was Friedman that actually states there that uh, they're admitting it publicly now. In other words, they were already doing it, uh, even as Russia has accused them of doing that. Uh, so, and there again, you know, I'm an American, I definitely support, and, and I've always believed that the United States has been in, a, in wars for our own freedom, fighting for the freedom so we can have freedom of religion. It is only more recently that I have really begun to understand that the United States is fighting the battles for the Vatican, for the Pope of Rome. And we clearly see this because we see the Pope of Rome now exerting his uh, his power in the United States over the entire world, and uh, as well, uh, you know, if you, as we reported before, if you're a 501c organization, which most churches are, you cannot say anything against the Vatican. You can't say anything against the Pope of Rome. In fact, we had one sister write us recently after I announced this, said she went to her pastor and asked him, are you a 501c, is our church a 501c entity? And he said, yes. She said, is it true? That, we, that you, as a 501c entity, cannot speak against the Pope of Rome the or, the, or the, the Vatican in this case. And he said, that's exactly true. She said, I will not be a member of this church. God bless her. God bless her for making that stand. Okay, so we go on there. The, the, the Bledsky said, um, okay, we know he's, they're, get, they're getting uh, troops, tanks. He says, uh, all volunteers were officially making 6,000 as far as the, the currency that they're using there, which is about $316 a month. 
but the fact we're getting about 10,000. So they're getting nearly double the salary. Again, remember Stockwell said they send large sums of money in to, to, to appease these people. Now this, if you remember also in, in the documentary, the footage that I shared with you uh, from uh, Crimea, the way back home, the documentary made by state television in uh, Russia, that was another thing that they pointed out. The, the commanders of the unit, now it wasn't the soldiers, the soldiers get a little bit more, no doubt, but the commanders, they had already, they had already tapped in, got the information, knew that they had called them back, wired money to the commander's accounts for the fight that they were willing to do in Crimea. So again, we see uh, the money trail, we might say, follow the money trail, which kind of brings me to another thought in itself there. You know, we know the, the Bible does say the love of money is the root of all evil. And who is the richest entity in the world? It's the Vatican, of course. They have more gold, more money, more assets, more stocks, bonds than any other entity or person in the entire world. So. If the love of money is the root of all evil, then we can certainly see that the root is Rome. They are the root. For world dominance, they want to control the world economic system. They are the love of all money. They are certainly the Judas of modern day. They have the money bag. They have the purse. They are controlling the world's financial institutions. They are the root of all evil. I never thought that that was actually a prophetic scripture, but now I see that it is. All right, so we continue on here. We see about the, the financial. Uh, the Beletsky did not say whether and how his views have changed since he wrote the Patriot of Ukraine program, but he said uh, his uh, priority now is extinguishing the pro-Russian rebellion. He also wants to extinguish the Russian people, period. By the way, he is uh, he, he does have a degree, and it is in, uh, in his history, political history, if I understand right. He says, we have only one goal right now, fighting for the homeland until all of it is freed. Then we will try to build a new Ukraine uh, that we could all be proud of. We are patriots. We believe in our nation. Nationalism is our ideology, he said. He has uh, since been elected to uh, the Ukrainian parliament, riding a wave of increased nationalist sentiment in Ukraine triggered by the war. That's the article there, as I said, that has definitely let us know that we are on the brink of war without any doubt whatsoever. Um, there was also another article that came out uh, on uh, global research that was very insightful there. It was Germany accuses NATO of dangerous propaganda. American strategic ob objective is to prevent a German-Russian alliance. The primordial interest of the United States, over which for a century we have fought wars, the first, second Cold War, has been the relationship between Germany and Russia, because united they are the only force that could threaten us, and to make sure that that doesn't happen. He is actually from Switzerland, is where he, uh, where he lives at. The article here says, Mr. Ganser, the German chancellery, accuses NATO Chief Philip M. Breadlove. By the way, he is, it's, it's interesting that he is the NATO Chief um, of, NATO, of NATO operations. He is actually a four-star general uh, with the United States Air Force. Uh, you'll find that all the leaders in uh, NATO are actually American generals, uh, but they, as he puts it here later, they put European faces to this. Anyway, it says, of dangerous propaganda, Breadlove exaggerates Russian military involvement in East Ukraine. For example, what is going on here is the German government just accusing NATO of war propaganda. Uh, Philip Mark... Uh, by the way, he, he was born in 1955. Uh, he's a four-star general of the United States Air Force, as I mentioned to you, who currently serves as the commander of the U.S. European Command as well as the 17th Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Uh, that's that's uh, the head of, of NATO forces, uh, of NATO Allied operations. He previously served as a commander of the U.S. Air Force in Europe as well. Uh, the article goes on to say, the German chancellor is right with its critique, uh, in my opinion. Something dangerous is happening right now. He says, U.S. general, like Breadloves, are trying to provoke a war. They're trying to provoke a war. The generals are trying to provoke a war, he states in his article. Where Germans and Russians would kill each other to weaken both countries. This is a cynical 
actually a diabolical plan, he writes. But this is exactly what the U.S. strategists like George Friedman, that's Dr. George Friedman he's speaking about, director of the Stratford Think Tank, are suggesting. United Germany and Russia are the only power that could threaten, uh, threaten the United States, uh, is what Friedman actually, and he actually did say, I've actually heard that, uh, said in a speech in February of 2014 in Chicago. That was just actually a few weeks ago, not very long ago at all. Uh, our primordial interest Preventing a German-Russian alliance is to ensure that will never happen, said Friedman. The U.S. as, as, a, as an empire can not intervene in Eurasia all the time. So let's take a, I'd like for you to hear a little bit of Dr. Friedman's report on this. Let's listen to that. Do you look to Europe, who, uh, whom, who has been criticized by Putin himself as the scourge of the earth, or do you look to yourself? Where do you look? What's next for Ukraine? Well, the first question you ask yourself, are you a Ukrainian speaker or a Russian speaker? Because Ukraine contains both. And while the idea of the Russian speakers genuinely wanting autonomy because they have been mistreated by the Ukrainian speakers is dismissed, it's also true. The Ukrainians do not want a federation. The Russian position is, and by that I mean the Russian, look, Canada has a federation. Quebec speaks its own language. It's okay. But the Ukrainians know that this is only the beginning. I mean, this will lead to devolution. What you do if you're a Ukrainian is essentially reach out to the only country that will help you, which is the United States. Uh, last week, Ten days ago, General Hodges, commander of U.S. Army Europe, visited Ukraine. He announced that U.S. trainers would now officially be coming, not just unofficially coming. Uh, he actually pinned medals on Ukrainian fighters, which by protocol of the military is not the way. Foreigners don't get to pin on you know, medals, but he did, showing that this was his army. He then left. And in the Baltics announced that the United States would be pre-positioning armor, artillery, and other equipment in the Baltics, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria, which is a very interesting point. So the United States, and now to yesterday, the United States announced that it would be sending weapons. Tonight, of course, they denied it, but they are. The weapons will go. Um, in all of this, the United States has acted outside the context of NATO. Uh, Ganser goes on to say in this particular article, he says, how is NATO trying to fuel this conflict? NATO General Breedlove often sticks out uh, by spreading exaggerated and untrue claims. This is how NATO is fueling the war. This is uh, dangerous because the situation is very tense. Uh, as we know, uh, on the 12th of November 2014, uh, Breedlove claimed that Russian troops and tanks have marched into Ukraine, but that wasn't true and it wasn't just a little thing. And by the way, that was also backed up by the scholar on Sophia's program, uh, scholar Stephen Cohen backed that up as well. He said that the Russians never did come in the way the United States was making it. Now, whether or not Russia has helped supply arms uh, and weapons to the Eastern Ukrainians, I can believe they have. Uh, there's, there's without a doubt they have. And there has been some reports that we see that Russians have actually died in the battle and have been buried secretly in uh, Russia. I've seen different films on that as well. Uh, so even if they did come in and begin to fight, you can't blame Russia because Russia has a strategic interest in maintaining a neutral place in Ukraine. So anyway, let's just, just drop that in there for you there. Uh, and anyway, so he goes on to say that uh, on, on the 12th of November, 2014, Breedlove claimed that the Russian troops and tanks have marched into Ukraine, and that wasn't true, and it wasn't just a little thing. Literally, the NATO general said, we have seen that Russian troops, Russian tanks, Russian artillery, and air defense systems have moved into Ukraine. BBC and other mass media spread that worldwide, but it was a lie according to uh, Mr. Ganser, he says there. And U.S. General Ben Hodges, commander of the U.S. troops in Europe, 
uh, also pushes for war by supporting the Ukrainian army. In January 2015, he visited a military hospital in Kiev and handed over a, a medal for bravery for the U.S. Army to a wounded Ukrainian soldier. That, of course, increases... To Europe. What threat is that aimed at? You. You're very dangerous. Look, this is driven by the Ukrainian crisis. There's a theory in the West of what the meaning of Ukrainian crisis is. That the Ukrainian crisis was started by Putin. That isn't true. But that's believed, that's the ideology. And the Ukrainian crisis is only the beginning. The Russia, the Kremlin, Putin, Russian imperialism is going to move on to the Baltics, to Poland. It's all ridiculous. There's no evidence for it. But there's been a group in NATO that for at least 15 years, you remember there was an agreement between NATO and Moscow that even though NATO would expand, there would be no NATO permanent military bases in these countries that came in closer to Russia. But there's been a group in NATO that for years has wanted to do that. They've seized the Ukrainian crisis at the NATO-Wales summit, whenever it was, a month ago, to create this so-called rapid deployment force of 4,000 men. What good is 4,000 men against the Russian army? Zero. But there's a reason. They're going to build bases, communication centers, barracks, airstrips in Poland, in the three Baltic countries, maybe Romania. Romania hasn't quite agreed. And that will be not only NATO expansion politically, which is what it was previously, but now it's actual military expansion. In addition, there is a plan, as you know, to build land-based missile defense installations in Poland and in those countries. So you're right, for the first time, there is a military expansion of NATO, not just political, toward Russia. But it's not too late to stop it. It's not too late. If leadership does what leadership is supposed to do, if states, men and women, do what they're supposed to do, we can end this Ukrainian crisis and stop this military expansion of NATO. It's not too late, but it's five minutes to midnight. However, the U.S. General Hodges, Hodges shows symbolically the U.S. is an active party of war in, the Ukra in Ukraine. It stands by the Ukrainian army that is fighting. The Russians supported separatists in the East Ukraine because Germany is a NATO member. There is a danger that German soldiers are dragged into the war by the U.S. similar to Afghanistan. Uh, after 2001. If that happens, then we have exactly the situation Friedman is asking for. Germans and Russians shooting at each other in, the, in Ukraine. Of course, I hope this won't happen. However, a peace movement needs to raise this and warn such dangers in order to avoid them. Absolutely. Let's take a listen real quick to, um, to um, Stephen Cohen on his idea of diplomacy in this regards. The, me, the Soviet foreign, or the Russian foreign office, everybody. And Europe said no, and Washington said no. No, you can't do that. Now what's happened? Nearly a year later, they asked Putin, please come to Minsk and discuss with Poroshenko, Russia, Ukraine, and Europe. A three-way deal. 4,000 people have died. One million people have been turned into refugees. The Donbass has been destroyed for an agreement that could have had without one shot fired in November 2001, one year ago. Who's responsible for that? Historians will look back and ask, who was responsible for the deaths of those people, that destruction, those refugees, when the outcome was available in November 2013 with a little diplomacy? That is a collapse of diplomacy. Why did the West exclude Russia from the negotiations in November? That's the question. In his article, he goes on to write, and uh, we're going to kind of conclude this here in just a moment here, is this is a very common thing. I mean that NATO lies, exaggerates, or deceives. Yes, regrettably, NATO has, on a regular basis, combined lies and war. In my book, NATO Secret Armies in Europe, Staged Terror and Clandestine Warfare, I show how. During the Cold War, NATO had built in Western countries supported by the CIA and British Secret Service M16 secret armies of which uh, existence the governments and populations didn't know anything about. Absolutely. Uh, especially the U.S. generals are dangerous because they have been continuously fighting wars in different countries during the last 70 years. And as representatives of an, of an empire, they are not only used to kill, but also to deceive. General Lehman uh, Lemenser 
for example, who served as the uh, uh, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, of NATO, between 63 and 1969. So one of Breedlove's predecessors suggested in the 60s that the U.S. should stage a war against Cuba by destroying an American ship at the military base in Guantanamo Bay and by staging terror attacks in Washington. Does that sound familiar? You know, kind of like some of the reports we've heard in the United States that uh, Obama's kind of spread orders about having certain things happen, but it didn't. Uh, does it bring back memories uh, about the 9-11 attacks? It certainly does, doesn't it? Anyway, staging uh, terror attacks in Washington and then for both crimes, accused Fidel Castro in order to get the American public behind the war. John F. Kennedy, however, stopped the operation, uh, and it was called Northwoods, but it shows how dangerous the officers in the Pentagon are, he writes in there. How come that in those cases nobody raises its voice and we only read the same NATO statements with their arguments? Uh, the mass media in Germany are pushing people into a direct confrontation with Russia in a way the radicals in the U.S. like uh, Stratford uh, Director Friedman are asking for. It means they fuel animosity towards Russia, and very rarely there is a critical discussion about NATO or about the strategic interest of the U.S., those powers that are fueling the war in Ukraine. Now, again, Stockwell, John Stockwell says in there that's exactly what they do, especially in the case of the, the racial issue. And of course, the Germans have very good reason to want to fight Russia. It would be easy to incite violence with the Germans because why? Russia came in. Russia, uh, you have the East and West Germany at, 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 after the war in, in 45, and half the country was under Russian occupation. So there's a lot of animosity towards Russia in that regards there. Not to mention it was Russia and the United States fighting Germany because of Hitler's regime. There's a lot of still Nazi ideology floating around in Germany. But the problem is, is that German Chancellor Merkel, she actually has and wants to see a peaceful resolve to come with the, with, the, with the Ukrainian crisis because she wants to get back to business as usual with Russia because 40% of Germany's exports go to Russia. So she's not as, as big into this, but nonetheless, the United States, with the Pope of Rome pushing for this global dominance, is definitely falling into this. Now, Let's move into Israel. Now that you begin to start seeing the bigger picture of what's going on. Now, scripturally speaking, we could go in the Bible and we can clearly see where Daniel writes about how that uh, the prince that shall come comes up strong with a small people, which are the Palestinians. And what is happening in Israel and has been happening, uh, especially after the 1967 war when Israel uh, was victorious with all of her Arab neighbors, but even since then, the Vatican has tried to gain control of Israel. They want uh, Jerusalem for themselves. Israel's not been willing to give them that. Israel has tried to compromise. They gave them uh, uh, Mount Zion, but the Pope of Rome wants more. He's still not satisfied enough. So therefore, they have incited the Palestinians. They have flooded money into the Palestinians. Uh, into the Hamas uh, terror, terror uh, regime uh, in Gaza, and they're constantly inciting violence. I remember speaking to a Palestinian cab driver one time in Israel. Uh, just, in fact, just recently, uh, we were talking together, and he said to me, he said, you know, Stephen, he said, we used to not have these problems. He said, ever since the first Intifada, he said, something happened to the Palestinian people, and they just have gone crazy. And he said, but why? He said, at one time, we could live in peace with the Israelis. We didn't, we were not fighting each other. But what is it? The Vatican pushes these fights, these wars. I've actually seen, I used to have the footage of it, of where the rallies that would be going on uh, in, in the Palestinian territories that they have called the West Bank, that they occupy at this particular point in time, they would show the footages uh, that what's going on, and you always saw Catholic priests in the background all around. So it, the Vatican is causing the United States, as we've seen Barack Obama, uh, we saw the articles even in the New York Times, 
uh, that, that Obama sent his uh, team down there to, to overthrow Netanyahu because why? Netanyahu is not fully cooperating with Rome the way that he's supposed to be doing. He's doing a lot of like the, the, the former president of Ukraine is doing. He's trying to play both sides in this here and it's not working. Uh, he, he's under the pressure of, of the United States, he's under the pressure of Rome, uh, and, and he's trying to play the politics of it, but it's not what God wants. And yet he's also trying, he's, he looks, he sees the word of God, he's not supposed to give over Israel uh, to Rome, to the United States, to the Palestinians, or anyone else. But this is exactly what they want. They're trying to destabilize the nation. They will cause, and if it doesn't, if they don't split the nation soon, then he will have Hamas, that is the Vatican, will cause the United States to pressure Hamas, the Syrians, the Iranians, and they will fund that war, and then they will fund Israel to fight one another to do what? To cause us to kill each other off is what they're doing. And then God is going to have enough of it. Because God sees every nation is turning against Israel. Now we know there are many Christian Americans that stand with Israel unconditionally. And God bless them for doing just that. We thank you for that. We know that God sees that as well. But the political side of this is all the nations will come against Israel. And no doubt that's why the Czech President Zaman will probably end up being ousted before long because he stands with Israel. He's doing everything contrary to what... Uh, the European Union, what the Pope wants. They, none of them like him because of this. But God bless him for making that stand. And God bless the American Christians for standing for the Jewish people of Israel and, and not turning your back on us. We know that, that, that you love us. But unfortunately, the Obama administration and the next administration, neither will have Israel's interests at heart. They're bringing the Pope of Rome to the United States to, 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 to bring about his one world government. It'll be the catalyst. The, the, it will be what springs off this new world order, uh, no doubt. And we've been hearing about as well, just got the reports in about the United States undergoing martial law tests all over the country um, and people really being uh, stirred up by this. Uh, things are getting very heated up. Anyway, if this news is, is, is valuable to you and you appreciate it, we do this 100% nonprofit. Uh, not, we're not a nonprofit organization, but we, we don't do this for profit, but it's your love and support that makes the news happen. So if that's all you listen to as the news, you don't listen to the biblical commentary that we do on Danuna Institute of Biblical Research, and you'd like to support this news programming, you can go to IsraeliNewsLive.org and you can contribute there. God bless you and thank you. Good night.